Steve, thanks for joining us. Uh, first off, I know you're a veteran of these talks, so I wanted to ask your impression on how these ones are proceeding. Well, it was interesting. I mean, it all started off very uh, grim and glum and, oh my gosh, nothing's ever going to come out of this and this could this be the end of the process? But I think, at least at uh, officials' level, there's a, a clear commitment to getting on with trying to solve what they can and then package the uh, big issues up for ministers. And from what I've been able to pick up, there is a, a fair amount of serious discussion going on behind, deep behind closed doors about what kind of a deal could come out of here. Some combination of a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol with a roadmap to uh, do a more comprehensive agreement at some point down the road. And I think, you know, the, the optimistic assessment at the end of week one is that uh, there is a deal to be had. Um, there are a number of problems getting to it. Uh, the biggest one, of course, being what to do with the U.S., because we know that they can't or won't agree to anything with any teeth. Uh, and even if they did, it wouldn't mean anything because they'd never get it through the Congress. So, and India's being very difficult. Um, you know, after a few years of being a more of a problem solver, they're, 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 much, they're back in their old style now, which is the 1970s rhetoric, which is not very helpful. But uh, um, China's, you know, uh, stepping out a bit more and are being very clear about what they need to see and, and uh, you know, the, the EU is, I believe, slowly coming around to the point of view of grasping the, the nettle and trying to figure out what they can get out of this process. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all very much in play still here at the beginning of week two and uh, it could all go very badly wrong. There's still a very high percentage possibility that that's the case, but it's also um, I think perhaps even more likely that we'll come out of here with some uh, compromise which we don't like very much but at least keeps the process ticking forward and there is still a small possibility that we could get something that would really move us in the right direction. So um, I'm, uh, it's the advantage of setting your expectations at just about zero is that uh, you probably won't be disappointed and you might even be pleasantly surprised. And we've heard this week that if these talks uh, go well, it'll be down to China. If they go badly, it'll be down to the US. And we've had positive signals from China this weekend. Are they significant, do you think? Well, I think China, I mean, the thing with China is that in terms of doing things to transform their economy uh, towards a low carbon development path and the development of renewable energy and efficiency and all the rest of it, they are doing more than anybody else by far, um, of the big countries anyway. And the question then becomes to what extent they're willing to, you know, take that out of the, the domestic box and put it that into the public arena in the form of some form of agreement, which they've been very reluctant to do in the past. But, uh, you know, with their growing stature as the driver of the, the global economy and the world's largest emitter and one where an awful lot of attention is being paid now, I think they're getting to grips with the idea that they need to be much more forthcoming. And that's a good thing because, I mean, actually what they're doing domestically is uh, in some ways quite extraordinary. I mean, certainly from my side, on the renewable side, half of the wind installations in the world last year were in China. The China has, uh, you know, twice as much solar hot water heater installed capacity as the entire rest of the world combined. Uh, they're the driver of the global PV industry now and are developing a domestic market. The, some of the efficiency measures they've taken in the previous five-year plan were extraordinary closing down 90 gigawatts of old coal-fired power stations. Um, they've got a long, long, long way to go, and it's going to be a multi-decade process before they get anything like to a sustainable economy, but they're, they're taking dramatic steps uh, in that direction. Um, it would be uh, nice if uh, the U.S. would recognize that and seek to support it rather than whining about Chinese companies selling good products cheaply in the United States and starting little trade wars and it would be nice if the US would do something for its own domestic industry which of course is at the moment facing the collapse of the only existing federal support systems uh, for wind energy for instance at the end of next year but uh, <clears throat> that's not really the fault of the delegation here that's uh, that's the Congress so uh, just what, what's the kind of status of renewables worldwide in, in amidst a kind of global economic downturn how have they coped well, I mean, 2010, we had nearly $250 billion invested in the clean energy sector. Um, there were more money and more capacity in renewable energy uh, power plants uh, installed in 2010 than there were fossils. So it's all moving in the right direction. Um, you know, the OECD markets at the moment are a bit stagnant and uncertain. I mean, uh, 
for me, uh, all the growth markets are outside of the OECD. Um, Mexico, Brazil, China, India, of course, even here in South Africa, things are going to get going. Hopefully we'll hear an announcement this week about the first round of tenders uh, in North Africa, in Kenya, in Chile, in Uruguay, in uh, Mongolia, and elsewhere around the world. I mean, that's where things are really happening. The European market is pretty solid and steady within the, within the framework of the uh, uh, 2020-20 legislation, but... Uh, you know, with the Eurozone crisis, that obviously doesn't improve things uh, at the moment. There's a lot of uncertainty about the, the solidity of the, the financial markets in that part of the world. But assuming that that gets uh, sorted out somehow, then I, I think uh, we'll end up 2011 with a fairly significant year-on-year uh, -year growth compared to last year. I think the same is true in the solar sector. And people, a lot of people expected the PV installations to be down this year because you wouldn't have the great big German bubble that we had in 2009. Uh, in 2010, rather, but it looks like uh, Italy's taken its place with a great big bubble, almost 11 gigawatts of solar being sold in uh, Italy during the course, course of 2011. The thing is, though, for solar, um, that they need to diversify the markets a lot more. It can no longer be dependent upon just uh, Germany, Spain, which Spain is in, you know, Spain is in bad shape for all the renewables technologies now after being real leaders for a long time. Uh, it would be nice to have a U.S. market of note. The Chinese are building one up, starting from a very low base. It would be nice to have an Australian market now, and we have, a, we have uh, some significant prospects for that, given the new legislation in, in Australia. So, um, you know, on the supply side, I would say that we're doing fairly well. I mean, it could always be better, and it could be faster. But uh, unfortunately, when it comes to climate change, we're not going to supply side our way out of this problem. And we've had some relatively optimistic reports from the UN, for example, in the last year about the potential of renewable energy. What, what's your take on this, given the political will that is kind of existing at the moment? Uh, well, I mean, I think that a growing number of energy planners uh, and uh, energy ministries around the world are beginning to contemplate the idea of a 100% renewable energy future. That's certainly under discussion in a number of European countries. <clears throat> the European Union is, is at this point looking well, the logical extension of their position vis-a-vis uh, -vis 2050 at this point is 100% renewable electricity sector by 2050. Uh, I think we're inevitably moving in that direction. It's a question of how fast and whether this climate process is going to help that or, or get in the way. I mean, you know, CCS as a, as a technology, as a solution, as a practical alternative or something going forward is dead everywhere except in the climate negotiations. You know, we've got all the CCS guys piling on here and saying how they're going to save the world. Same thing they've been saying for the last 10 years, and there are still no commercial CCS plants anywhere because I just don't think it's a commercial technology. And so in the marketplace, that they're not a reality. Same with nuclear, really. I mean, you know, especially after Fukushima, but even before then. I mean, the economics just don't... The economics and the time scale and, you know, as, as the, if, if governments may build a few nuclear plants, but the private sector isn't going to isn't going to engage in that. It's just taking a 60-year bet on the price of electricity and the uh, uh, regulations in relation to uh, nuclear waste disposal and a few other things. It's just not a, it's not a viable commercial proposition. So from that side, I think we're in pretty good shape. I mean, the global uh, uh, turn down, uh, downturn in the economy doesn't help, of course. Uh, the situation with commercial banking sector, particularly in the, in the Anglo-Saxon world, excluding Canada, where their commercial banks are pretty healthy still, but in the UK and the US, and well, Australia is not so bad. But, uh, you know, before the big crisis in 2008, the vast majority of, of, uh, of uh, wind projects were built out with uh, finance provided by commercial banks. That's much less now. Uh, there's a much greater role of uh, public sector financial institutions and private equity and, and all the rest of it in, in, you know, big utilities who have gotten into the sector financing things off of their own balance sheets. That's a, that's a much larger percentage of the market now than it was, than was even conceivable pre-2008, pre-Lehman Brothers. But uh, I think that's the new reality and we're getting adjusted to it. And some of the international financial institutions are responding quite well. The, the Asia Development Bank, the IFC, even the Inter-American Development Bank. The World Bank is still pretty hopeless, but, you know, we, we always knew that. But I, the most important players really are the national development banks or regional ones like uh, you know, the BNDS in Brazil, uh, the 
you know, the state-run commercial banks in China. Um, the European Investment Bank now getting more and more into financing, uh, particularly offshore wind and some of the other bigger projects and the infrastructure that's necessary to to make that all work economically. And there just are no equivalents to that in the in the in the and the German. Uh, Regional and state development banks have played a key role in this industry for a very long time. Given the economic and political situation worldwide, it sounds relatively optimistic or relatively positive. What are the implications for consumers if we see this kind of switch to renewables? Well, we'll have a stabilization of electricity prices, for one thing. Um, you won't have the ups and downs associated with, uh, especially in places which are... Uh, dependent upon imported fossil fuels, you won't see the wild swings in prices. Um, you know, if you build a wind plant or a solar plant today, you know what the electricity is going to cost tomorrow and you know what it's going to cost 20 years from now. You can't say the same with fossils or, or uh, other forms of uh, conventional generation. Um, and uh, with the cost of the technology going down and down and down, I mean, we're, wind power now in, in the best wind sites, we're competing directly with fossil fuels and winning even in places where there is no carbon price. And in places with a carbon price, we're, we're well ahead of the game. I think the economics will turn out to be uh, in, in, in Europe, such that after the beginning of the third phase of the ETS, uh, wind will far, be far and away the cheapest way to add capacity to the grid. And we hear a lot about the importance of an energy mix due to the fact that wind energy and solar energy isn't reliable on a day-to-day -day basis. Can that be achieved using 100% renewables as well? Oh, sure. If you, if you get a lot of hydro, that's not a problem. If you get biomass, that's not a problem. You get geothermal, it's dispatchable. You've got uh, uh, various storage options. Yeah, it's 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 uh, technically it's not the problem. I mean, depending on the location and how well the energy system is integrated and diversified. You know, but what we're really talking about a transformation of the power sector. You know, people talk about integration of renewables into the grid, but the existing grid system was, uh, uh, most of the existing grid systems or the way they traditionally build them are, you know, basic trunk and branches, 19th century, end of 19th century, early 20th century concept of how this is done and what we're moving towards is much more, something which much more resembles the internet so-called smart grids with a, a wide variety of distributed sources of supply, sophisticated demand management and load management options that that will allow you. And uh, yeah, it, the, the complicated bit if you're talking about a renewables, 100% uh, renewables or a very large penetration of renewables uh, into your system is that every single one is going to be different depending on the combination of uh, what resources are available, uh, you know, what sort of renewable resources available, what financial resources available, what the demand uh, profile looks like, how willing people are to, uh, to uh, play along with demand management and how sophisticated the tra transmission system operator can be. And that will vary a lot from place to place. But, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I don't, there's, no, there's no fundamental technological uh, imperatives to a very, very high penetration.